Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Brian Leaners from Home Run Resources. How are you today? I'm good, Tracy. How you doing? You have had so much news since we spoke last month and exciting news. Let's start with the 100% anemone-free solar glass. Okay, that sounds exciting because we've been tracking anemone. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a milestone event to say the least um, it, it, on two fronts. One is that one of the difficulties in the solar glass space globally is that in the recycling of modules, solar modules, the glass is uh, the outlier. It's the problem uh, because nobody wants that glass because in China, which makes 95% of the solar glass on the planet, they dope that glass with antimony in order to reduce uh, the effects of the metal content in particular the effect of high iron content. So with our silica, our unique silica that we have in Brazil and Bahia, we have extremely low iron content, like it's the lowest iron content in a large uh, silica sand deposit in the world. Uh, and so from that perspective, we asked our technical folks in Germany uh, if they could envision a way in which we could remove the standardized antimony in solar glass from the equation and they worked on that and both of them actually came back with reports almost simultaneously that said, yeah, you actually can produce solar glass of high efficiency and great quality without using antimony. So that was great because that's a really good environmental issue. That's a really good recycling issue relative to the industry being truly circular because uh, the glass was the issue. Uh, and then the other aspect of that, it has a financial benefit uh, because antimony, as you probably know, is extremely expensive and the Chinese are holding on to it because they need it for their own industrial processes. Uh, and then the other aspect of that, which I think is really important, is there is a move in, in mostly in the developed world, United States uh, and the EU, to move away from antimony uh, in solar glass. There, there isn't a solution, but there is a desire. And so you can see EU solar papers that talk about how they need to get away from antimony in solar glass. The United States is looking at the same thing. So when we put out that news, we actually got a lot of incoming traffic relative to being that entity. And it has two aspects to it. One is our silica, uh, because our silica produces that no antimony glass. Uh, and the other obviously is the antimony free solar glass. So yeah, big milestone. Uh, I don't think it was well understood within the investment community, but it was definitely well understood uh, within the alternative energy, specifically the solar community. So in the solar community, of course, you started to answer my next question from this answer, of course, which is your phones must be ringing off the hook. And what should we be looking forward to with you know large solar glass producers? I mean, are you planning on making a deal with just one of them, an exclusive, or what's your strategy with that? Uh, the strategy has modified relative to timeline. Uh, the strategy was always to sort of focus on Brazil as a major solar market, number four or five in the world on an annualized basis, and, and, a, and a market that is promoting that, right? So it's not like United States, for instance, where it's a huge solar market, but the administration, the current administration in the U.S. is not promoting that. It's actually removing and placing barriers in front of that, although that will not be effective, as we can see in the raw data. So from that perspective, it, it has facilitated a, a, a momentum relative to our international strategy. Uh, we have been contacted or recontacted by entities in the solar space. Uh, who have become interested in what we have to offer both from a silica sand perspective for solar glass and from a solar glass perspective for solar modules uh, because of that uh, new category of being antimony free. Uh, and, and then we go through a spec process where they analyze what our spec capabilities will be at the end of our production line. We've designed the production line so that it's very, very uh, it can be modified relative to 
a variety of different end user specs. That's novel as well. Uh, so I think the, the, the quick answer is, is it's speeded up the business development within that international area for both our silica sand for solar uh, glass and our, and our antimony free solar glass. So obviously the antimony, uh, antimony free solar glass, fascinating. Can you please provide some additional advantages for this? If you're looking at solar from a return on investment perspective, the number one material that goes into that product from a return, large material that goes into that product on a return on investment perspective is the glass. The glass actually makes margin. Uh, the, the, the silicon does not make margin. The Chinese basically give that away in order to subsidize their solar module industry and their solar input industry. But the glass, no matter where it's going, is profitable. So that's the focus that we have within solar is to focus on that particular area of solar. Obviously, we have a strategic advantage because we have a silica resource in Brazil that is, it's like Mother Nature got together with a solar glass engineer and they decided, let's make the perfect product. Uh, and and that, is, that is what we have control of in Brazil. Speaking of exciting news, just in the last month, Brian, I read this headline and I had to read the news release like three times. Home Run, Rare Earth Element Separation Technology Partnership. What is going on here with Rare Earth Elements? Well, what we wanted to do within the context of our higher purity, our ultra pure product, we're, we're looking for markets that are traditional with some traditional players in those markets, but we're also looking for new markets. And we've made it quite clear that one of those that we're going after is, is battery anode, but another that we're looking at and we've spent some time on is the application of silica within the context of doing ion exchange in the processing of rare earth elements. And so, you know, in, in, in typical Brian Leaner's fashion, I, I, I want to disrupt that process. I don't want to equal that process. There's no value in doing what someone else can do. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at introducing a couple of new concepts with our partner. Uh, there'll be another partner involved in this process. I don't think people are familiar with Brazil has a huge endowment of rare earths of the IAC quality, the type that you get in China, the type that you get in, in Myanmar, uh, the type that you get in Malaysia, you know, the sort of new uh, areas for the production and obviously the historic area for production of rare earths being China. So the West needs new technologies because you can't do what the Chinese are doing, which is in situ leach. That's not allowed, like in Brazil in particular, that is not allowed. You're never gonna get a permit to do that. So we looked at some new uh, techniques and obviously we're focused on this from a silica perspective because our ultra pure silica will produce a product called silica gel. Silica gel is a very, very uh, high purity silica that's used in a variety of industrial purposes. One of those purposes is ion exchange and ion exchange works to remove the elements, the, the rare earth elements uh, from the materials that precede uh, that processing. So we'll be looking in that. We're going to have further news releases relative to uh, some uh, R&D partners and, and some uh, input partners in that regard. But we see that as a large market for our silica, our high purity silica, in particular in Brazil, because Brazil is going to be a large producer of rare earths and they need processing and the government is trying to facilitate processing. Certainly, that sounds incredibly exciting, especially for everybody in the investor news audience. But you've had additional news that you just put out, uh, what, uh, earlier this week about uh, engaging DTEC engineering to advance your bankable feasibility study for your first antimony free solar glass project in the Americas. So, where do we start with this one? Uh, the, the BFS process, if people are familiar with it, it, it is, is a pretty standardized process where internally you go from a, a PEA uh, to uh, uh, an early stage feasibility study, and then you go into the final bankable feasibility study. The bankable means that that's the study you use 
to finance your project or finance what whatever you're doing under that feasibility study. So what we did was we started executing on this pathway uh, about a year ago. So within the context of the last year, we've put together that PEA and that pre-feasibility study internally. We're delivering all of that work into DTEC relative to getting the bankable feasibility study done in a really short period of time because of all of that preparatory work that our team has done. And that feasibility study, the bankable feasibility study is the deliverable against financing. We've been parallel pathing. Uh, people who have been following us know uh, that we're in dialogue with BNDS, uh, the industrial fund of the federal government of Brazil. Uh, and that's going really well. And then we've also got some international interest relative to financing that solar glass plant that is coming underneath that bankable feasibility study. So I'm really proud of our team because my mandate to them was to speed up the process. The average BFS process in the mining industry is what, three to five years minimum. Uh, we've squeezed that. We will have squeezed that into a one year uh, timeline, which is, is, a, is testament to the quality of the individuals that we have working at Home Run. And, and the strategy and how we execute on that strategy relative to deliverables. So there will be a lot of deliverables related to that BFS. Uh, and that BFS obviously is a huge uh, uh, milestone deliverable from a material perspective, because that's usually the re-rate point relative to a, we wanna be in cash flow to, oh, you are gonna be in cash flow subject to financing based on the BFS. And of course, considering all this news just came out in the last month, I caution our audience to put on their speed helmet when I ask you, what should we anticipate in the upcoming quarter? We go through news cycles, like high density news cycles with regards to how we operate as a team. So we meet and then we go, okay, over the next three, six, nine, 12 months, these are the deliverables. So that gets kind of chunky. Uh, and we've had that over our three year history where all of a sudden we go into these sort of hyper news cycles. We have pretty steady news anyways, as you know, but we go into these hyper news cycles. We're in one of those right now. So we've got 10 to 15 material deliverables that are in process as you and I speak today. Uh, and the goal on those is to get all of those finalized prior to the end of the year, give our team a little bit of a break as people may know uh, the holidays, the summer holidays in Brazil uh, start at Christmas time and extend into January. So, you know, that gives our team a bit of time off in January, although I'll still be cracking the whip relative to making sure that that BFS gets delivered in Q1. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're sitting on, you know, they're not finalized yet, but they will be finalized in that time period, somewhere between 10 and 15 uh, different material deliverables. And that's across the entirety of our of our vertical. So, of course, high-grade silica, antimony-free solar glass, and we also talked about rare earth extraction technology processes. For those of you interested, please go to the following website. Brian, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Tracy. We appreciate it.